Hey, I'm Mark Nadal, <laughs> and I like to do dangerous things, like implementing a database in JavaScript. <laughs> ah, otherwise known as, welcome to my talk on the last eight years of pain, misery, and suffering. But the largest thing is actually not JavaScript itself, it is JSON. <laughs> and the DOM. So, as Jared's already shown, we can actually get JavaScript to go faster and faster and faster if you just start ignoring certain things that Douglas Crockford did. <laughs> Sorry. So I'm going to first do some benchmarks just to show off a little bit of what Gun does, and then um, jump into how fast we can push things over the last eight years. So the first example is just, well, what's um, a base app in Gun? So this is nine lines for a copy and paste app. Let me start up this over here. Switch. And jump over here. So two tabs. Gun will synchronize data between the two tabs. So it's like an open source version of Firebase with a lot of cool other features inside of it. Now we're going to jump into what I call our panic tests, which is going to synchronize 100,000 chat messages between these two tabs. And we're going to see how fast it goes. Mocha test. Let me increase that. Um, panic chat JS. Panic is a really cool tool that we built. Um, it lets you do distributed load and correctness tests. Let me jump over to the right tab. And then it's going to start. So it's generating 100,000 messages. And while I'm streaming 100,000 messages, I'm still able to click this button. That's really important. The UI still responds as it's syncing the data. So we just did 11,000, oh, 10,000, 10.9 thousand chat messages per second between these two browser tabs. This is on a MacBook Air from 2015. <laughs> If you run this on an M1, um, if you actually want to run it yourself, all you have to do is npm install gun mocha and and um, cd node modules gun and and um, mocha test panic chat. And then you can test how fast it runs on your own computer. So on an M1, I've seen this go at about 67,000 <laughs> chat messages per second. And we started a debate, right? Is Rust going to make this any faster? So my colleague started implementing a Rust port of Gun. And even though his Rust port is not finished, <laughs> so it's not completely protocol compatible, it's not spec compliant, um, it still, the JavaScript version runs about 97% the speed of the Rust version. So if you wind up, um, a little kind of note here is, is when I was running these tests before, on every single callback of an update that I got inside of Gun for a new chat message, I would just put that straight into the DOM. But because Gun was synchronizing at almost 11,000 chat messages per second, DOM couldn't handle getting that many um, UI updates in a single call. So I had to switch this benchmark to use request animation frame. And it's actually skipping over probably, uh, you can do the math, probably about um, 20 to 30 chat messages per second on that input box. So <laughs> even in the process of testing this, I had this issue where like, I was thinking Gun was going about 10 times slower than what it actually was going, just because DOM was getting in the way. This is still running off of JSON, though. So how did I, how did I fix that? How did I get the UI to be responsive? Well, I went and I implemented um, a custom JSON parser <laughs> um, in JavaScript called Wyson, a yielding object notation. So you can go to um, gun slash lib slash wyson.js. It's only about 250 lines of code. And I'm going to just go over a couple of benchmarks I was doing as I was exploring how to get 
JSON to go faster and faster and faster to figure out um, what are some of the persnickety things that show up in JavaScript land. So I'm going to switch over to, um, it's kind of hard to see in my screen, this file here, which is just, I got a bunch of different types of JSON files that I then parse. And I do them with regular JSON, my YSON um, library, ISON, and JSON2, um, just to compare some performance. I can actually, I shouldn't have closed that one. <laughs> that, I'll have to pull it back up later. So the first thing I'm going to do is just running um, a very basic, uh, parsing a very basic um, JSON file. It's 601 bytes. It's pretty small. It's tiny. So I'm going to run. But see, now, now I'm really curious to do uh, with bun. <laughs> Node run. <laughs> yep. <laughs> In this case, it's just the parser. It took uh, JSON zero seconds, um, YSON one millisecond, JSON two, and ISON uh, six and two. So at least compared to other non-native JSON implementations, um, my implementation is going a, a bit faster. So now let's knock that up to a slightly um, larger file. This is uh, radix structure, which is deeply, deeply nested. And you'll see how that bites me in the butt later. Um, it's fairly large. I, I mean, this is the scroll bar over here. So um, it's, it's quite a bit of data. Um, it was a radix, radix, where is it? It's about 2.5 megs. So let's parse that one. Oh, and then stringify, uh, you see that YSON is going the same speed as, as JSON for that small piece. So we're going to run it here. And you see that JSON is doing about 33 milliseconds. YSON is about uh, half the speed. 67 milliseconds. However, it's still doing better than um, ISON and some of the other parser um, libraries. If you know one that you'd like to throw into these benchmarks, I'd love to compare as well. Um, now let's step up to big.json. I believe that is 20 megs. Uh, let's big.json, yes, 20 megs. And it's not so happy with mine. Uh, 131 milliseconds for JSON. YSON's about half a second. So you've got to start realizing like 20 megs isn't that much data. But <laughs> now it's taking a tenth of a second for JSON to process things. And because JavaScript is single threaded, it's blocking the thread. It means you cannot accept any more WebSocket requests. You cannot accept any web requests during that time. And so JSON, as you start dealing with kind of larger um, chunks, can be really bad. It will choke the thread. Um, what a lot of people like to do is they like to dump large <laughs> JSON into JSON. So this is this next test, which is like, well, what if we have a video file? that just gets plopped into JSON. I don't know why, but you know, people do junk like this. Interesting. Native JSON takes about 20 milliseconds, and YSON takes about 2 milliseconds. So before, on average, we're about 2 to 5 times slower than native JSON. And now for an object with a JSON object, let's pull it up. Um, if Sublime is going to be happy with this. It's a very small JSON, but it's got a huge value inside of it that's embedded in it. And some workloads have this behavior. So it turns out that we can actually implement things that are faster. And this is not only faster in terms of it taking two milliseconds than native, but it's also not going to block the thread. Every 32 kilobytes is going to pause and let the thread breathe and handle other requests. So it's possible to write in pure JavaScript, um, systems that are approaching the native performance of uh, V8, and then hopefully even better <laughs> when we switch over to JavaScript core and, and bun. For small objects, again, at the very beginning, I just kind of want to note that for my workload that I see in production a lot of the, the teams that we work with, the difference between JSON and YSON is pretty much negligible. So for small JSON objects, whoop de doo right? Maybe it's two times slower, but it's way more important to keep the thread available. Now, why? 
did I optimize this to, to have these large chunks? Well, let's, let's switch over, and I'm going to run uh, another demo of something you can do inside of Gun. But I got to remember where I exited. OK, npm start. Let's hop over here. Oh, and, and note that the data persists, <laughs> as, as a database should. Gun not only synchronizes data, but it also persists the data. So what if I want to start doing live streaming between browser tabs by saving it into Gun? <laughs> <laughs> so here I'm live streaming over Gun, and I, I'm super apologetic to um, the the Wi-Fi network here, because I'm just literally blasting UDP packets nonstop into it. So I apologize. It's multicasting. And a fun thing here that I did is I can actually uh, live change the quality. So I can like go down and make it kind of blurry, <laughs> or I can increase it. And this app, right, the, the, the app that was just doing the, um, the copy-paste synchronization is nine lines. Well, this one is 39 lines. Oh, actually, sorry, this is the wrong one. Um, oh, that's a, a BitTorrent <laughs> tracker on top of Gun, which maybe I shouldn't be. <laughs> um, stream. Hmm. It, it's somewhere on the GitHub. I'm going to show you. But it's, it's only about like 40 lines of code to implement uh, this video sync. OK. So, I'm going to jump back to, so there's lots of different things you can do on top of Gun. Um, I'm just going to quickly show you. No, GitHub. <laughs> no. Um, I got 16,000 stars, not quite as much as <laughs> Jared's 30,000 stars. So <laughs> help uh, star me up. Um, lots of people are doing different stuff, everything from uh, real-time GPS tracking for like peer-to-peer -peer Uber to on top of A-Frame, doing like Metaverse gun sync on top of A-Frame and Babylon JS, as well as uh, graph analysis. Mozilla, this is kind of where I got into doing the video stuff. Mozilla gave one of the teams in our community a grant to do a peer-to-peer -peer encrypted Zoom alternative in the browser. And of course, IoT stuff, as well as then like augmented reality sync between devices. So there's lots of cool different use cases you can build um, on top of gun. So back to the talk. Now that we've kind of gone a little bit into the science <laughs> of pushing things to the limit of how fast we make JavaScript, obviously, Gun's more than just a custom JSON parser <laughs> that is CPU scheduled. It's absurd that I had to write a CPU scheduler in JavaScript in order to make things go faster, because JavaScript's single-threaded. But it turns out that. Um, parsing things over time lets that thread breathe, and it gives you better performance and a responsive UI that doesn't lock things up both in the browser as well as um, on any Node.js machine or, or bun. So the rest of Gun is also very carefully handcrafted for pretty much every operation to be O1. Um, if you're curious about including the conflict-free replicated data type that I implemented to do the deterministic data sync. I've done plenty of talks on this before. So if you're kind of curious about the computational complexity of things and how CRDTs work, I've done some cartoon explainers. Uh, just check my, my Twitter, and I'm happy to share those talks with you. So I want to focus on the other side of computational complexity, which is storage. So in computer science, time and space are a trade-off between each other. If we want to make things faster, we can pre-index things by using storage and caching stuff. And that will use up more storage space in order to save time space. And vice versa, if you don't have much storage space, you can chew through CPU to generate different views and stuff like that. So we've been helping the Internet Archive, which is the top 300 website in the world. They have about 40 petabytes worth of data to decentralize their data store on top of Gun. I'm going to jump into um, a demo that they have up on that, dweb.archive.org, for those who are curious that want to help out uh, libraries. 
So it works. It loads. It's there. And just to rag on some people, we see that um, WebTorrent is doing a great job of delivering on things. Gun is doing a great job on delivering on things. However, some very popular um, alternative systems are not doing so good of an engineering job of delivering on the archives data set. <laughs> um, so I had the honor of talking to one of the engineers at the Wayback Machine. And it turns out that they are using a data structure called binary search, which I recently fell in love with for doing storage. And binary search relates to this thing earlier. <laughs> Um, I guess I don't, oh, I do have that up, where I was previously storing the data inside of GUN as this radix tree, because radix trees have an O1 lookup relative to the total data set size. However, radix trees produce very deeply nested structures. And turns out V8 does not like to navigate up and down when serializing these things out to JSON. So I tested switching over to um, binary search to keep things as a flat heap, and it is insanely fast. Um, and I'm going to do some benchmarks in just a second. But I first want to explain how binary search for the uninitiated works. You can think of it as being a book. Imagine there is a book that has all of the information in the entire universe inside of it, and it's organized as a dictionary. So generally speaking, if you're trying to find um, SF node, right, you're roughly going to open up to the middle of the book. And you might see, oh, well, it came across Mark. And we know that Mark is a little bit earlier than SF node. So we're then going to turn to the right about halfway from the middle point to the end point. And oh, maybe we get too far and we go to T. And now we need to backtrack. And so we go to the halfway point in between. This is a um, O log in operation. And so it should be slower than the radix tree, which is O1. However, if we take this data, um, and I should probably actually start having it generate it. Uh, unfortunately, I can't show you against the whole 40 petabytes. I'm going to try and scale it down to something that we can fit in memory in a browser to benchmark how um, nicely binary search works. So I believe it is this file right here. Um, so this is the binary search function that I implemented right here, um, and then just a randomness. And I'm going to generate an array of 10 million randomly generated words, and then sort them, because that's necessary for a binary search to work. I'm going to hit refresh and start this up. Uh, it's going to take a little bit just to, to generate the list. But typically, this is actually the data that's already stored on a system, and then you wind up just using binary search to find or retrieve the data. So once it's generated, um, we're then just going to randomly sample for about 100 uh, random keys in the table, and we're going to print them out. And we're going to see how fast that goes. 10 million records inside of the browser. Mm, my computer's, there we go. <laughs> OK. So. Once the list is there, the binary search is almost free for finding any one record in the entire 10 million records in JavaScript. Okay? It's only taking about 0 0.02 milliseconds, 0 0.01 milliseconds. I wonder how much faster this would be with bun. So for 10 million records, okay, and each record could itself be a page of like 4 kilobytes or 16 kilobytes. It doesn't really matter what the, the byte size. We can find the data very, very quickly. 10 million records, and we can find it in about 0 0.02 milliseconds. That's, that's encouraging. I, I actually had my friends with uh, M1 laptops, since I still have a MacBook Air. That's 2015, and it's doing 10 million records finding any random one in 0 0.02 milliseconds run on their machines. And it turns out that even on the M1, we saw significant performance improvements on the data sync between two different browser tabs, the about 10,000 chat messages per second I showed you earlier, up to about uh, 70, 60 or 70,000 chat messages per second. The binary search didn't really run any faster on the M1. It was also running at about 0 0.01 milliseconds. So it seems like 
<coughs> as long as you have a heap in JavaScript that you're looking against, um, uh, whether it be JavaScript core or even V8, you can do some uh, really, really nice optimizations. Oh, I actually forgot. Back in the JSON parser, um, there was that fyson. Um, and fyson, this is just a random nugget. Sorry to, to jump back. fyson was the, the JSON parser implemented with if statements versus the one that I wound up using um, is the exact. So this is the same code as yson, and it's got all if statements over here. Um, compared to over here, I use switch statements. I, I hate switch statements. But I was able to shave a few milliseconds um, off in terms of getting faster performance by using switch statements rather than um, if statements in my Wison parser. And again, it's only like 250 lines of code. So <laughs> that's, that's the granularity I was checking things against. Pretty much the exact same code line for line, except for switch versus if. Um, so sorry, back to the binary search. Yeah, we didn't really wind up seeing um, much uh, performance difference, even on an M1 um, versus my laptop for, for binary search. So binary search is a really, really nice algorithm um, because it lets the JavaScript engine optimize against a heap. And what's really exciting is it turns out that Internet Archive uses binary search. For, their, for the Wayback Machine. So for their 40 petabytes worth of data, they have a top level index, which is, I think, about a 60 gigabyte file that does binary search at the top level. And then I think it's multiple layers deep. So um, what has me really excited is, is looking at the storage complexity, the, the storage constraint side of the equation, versus the compute um, or processing side of the equation is partly because I'm trying to figure out how can I go even faster than the 65,000 ops per second. And I realize the trick is if we have pages that we can memory swap between machines, then we can actually eliminate having to do all of the packet handling and message sending and serialization steps that happens in the regular uh, JavaScript world. Because now we're just going to be swapping UTF-8, UTF-16 um, files between machines and using a data structure that I call book for binary search. Um, that is a parseless data structure. So of a particular page, the one I've found that I'm going to be using is four kilobytes. Um, if there's only one particular property in that four kilobyte record set, then we actually don't yet have to parse any of the other data like JSON does. If you, if you want to get one record in JSON, you have to parse the whole thing. But using a different format like this, we can memory swap pages between machines and then parselessly pull out a single record um, in the callback in JavaScript land for people who are using GUN in the, in the database side. So in my uh, rough benchmarking, th this is not implemented yet, but in the rough benchmarking, I've seen about another 10 times um, speed improvement. In this case, it's, it's byte transfer speed compared to just pure messages per second. So that's kind of the future of um, where I'm taking GUN. I'm working with the Internet Archive on these large data sets and trying to be able to scale up to their capacity and figuring out all the tricks of the trade to, to make something that's already really fast be even faster. So I hope you enjoyed this uh, journey into different data structures, different performance trade-offs, different little hacks and tricks. Avoid JSON. <laughs> Avoid the DOM. <laughs> and maybe your life will not be eight years of pain and misery of re-implementing the same thing again and again and again and again until people like Jared just wind up saying, you know what? <laughs> Let's just replace it all with Zig. <laughs> Um, we are looking for other teams that have uh, more than about 10 million uh, monthly active users. The current in production runs for um, GUN is roughly around, let's see, 128,000 concurrent users connected right now. This is um, more battle testing, so it doesn't represent an actual production workload. But I'm looking for other um, teams that are smaller than the Internet Archive and a little bit larger than the 10 million monthly. Um, users that we're currently testing against to experiment with some of this JavaScript performance improvements. So thanks so much. <laughs>